A warm welcome, everyone, to our daily wrap-up. I'm Axel Throffel with Reuters. Uh, just before I introduce uh, our speakers for this uh, closing session, uh, I just want to quickly wrap, uh, recap some of the highlights of a ve very busy day uh, here in Glasgow. Uh, the Global Methane Pledge, over 100 nations, voluntary commitment to, uh, methane, uh, to cut methane emissions by 30% by the end of the decade. The Green Grids Initiative, a pledge by the UK and India, endorsed by 80 nations to create continental uh, electricity supergrids, including solar. The African Union calling on uh, uh, philanthropists and governments to support two and a half billion dollars a year for the next five for climate adaptation measures. Uh, John Kerry was out and about speaking today, uh, saying rich countries have now pledged 98 billion dollars of the 100 billion annual investment for developing countries made in 09. We were talking uh, a lot about that uh, throughout the day today. We'll get our uh, um, some opinion on that in just a sec as well. Uh, BlackRock, Larry Fink was in this studio. He told GHS at COP26 that it's raised $673 million for investments in climate infrastructure uh, in emerging markets. Uh, those were just a few of the many highlights uh, of the day. Let me introduce my panel now. Rianne Marie Thomas from GFI is next to me here. Um, Andy Briggs from Phoenix next to Rianne Marie. Uh, we have John Green, CCO for 91, and Mike Hugman, Director of uh, Finance for Climate at CIF. Uh, a very warm uh, welcome to all of you. You've made it through the day. Uh, it's been a busy one. Uh, did, what, did I leave anything big out of that first up? Uh, I think uh, Jeff Bezos made an announcement about nature today, which is obviously at the forefront of where we need to get to with climate finance. But I think it's almost impossible to keep up with all the announcements. And we're not even on finance day. Mm -hmm. That's coming tomorrow. And we're all absolutely anticipating what the Chancellor has to say tomorrow. But already it's, it's proving to be just a, a unstoppable momentum at this COP and it's yeah. pretty exciting to we, be I mean, we, we touch, I mean, yes, the Chancellor speaks tomorrow. Looks like it's going to be an exciting announcement. Looks like there's going to be news in it, which I think uh, is an important thing. But we did touch on a lot of the finance bits today uh, with Mark Carney, uh, with Larry Fink. Um, Andy, let me, let me kick it off with you here because one of the questions I posed to Mark this morning was, what is the mood music like among the GFANS members, given what we're seeing at the policy level? Um, what a lot of people are calling rather lackluster uh, uh, promises. Yeah, I mean, w one thing that's really struck me, and a number of people have commented, is pre previous COPs have been very heavily public sector driven. To, to, this COP seems to be much more strongly private sector driven and I would say amongst the GFANS members there's a real passion and desire to, to invest our customers money in making a massive difference uh, in, in climate change but we do need um, a, a lot more consistent uh, stable policy development to enable that to happen. Mm. We've got some good examples but we're only scratching the surface of what's possible at the moment. Yeah. Uh, by the way the police sirens and the drums you can hear are uh, one of the demonstrations going on uh, uh, just outside of our studios here. Uh, John, um, uh, 91, um, Emerging markets, of course, a big discussion. It's going to be a very, very big discussion uh, again for us here in this studio uh, tomorrow and what needs to happen. John Kerry talked about 98 billion, so we're getting closer to that 100. But I, I guess the question needs to be, that's, that's now. What happens when we need it the second time, the third time, the 10th time, the 50th time? Yeah. Is that not a worry? So great announcement today by the South African delegation, actually, uh, $8.5 billion commitment to decarbonizing the grid in South Africa, which is one of the most carbon intense in the world. So I think fantastic step forward. The key will be to see if that can be used in a way to leverage private capital. And I think that's, that's the real debate uh, around the funding of emerging market activity. You know, in the past, we've seen uh, we've seen public capital competing rather than crowding in uh, private capital in emerging markets. And, and I think the transition question is now so necessarily a question that, that all funders and all asset owners need to take seriously. And, and, and so I, I think that, that tomorrow and in the coming days, if we can address that question, how do you really crowd in private capital? How do you take the barriers away from private cap, bit of bit of mis, uh, risk mitigation from yep. the um, multilaterals, 
But also I think some of the things that private capital is constrained by sure. need, need to be addressed. You know, linear carbon reduction targets. Yeah. Are those right to crowd in private capital to emerge? I, 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 guess, I guess my fear, my worry is, you know, with my layperson's hat on, and, you know, I'll, I'll throw this at anyone, is, you know, we've been mulling these problems, these conundrums, for quite a while. You know, we, we talk now here in, in, at, at COP26 in Glasgow about, you know, unlocking this, the potential of this capital, getting it out there to the, to the real economy. I mean, we have been trying to work this one out for a while, haven't we? Why, Mike, why don't you come in on this? I, I mean, I think it's a very reasonable point. I, I think, um, you know, there's a number of things that policy makers could do, the MDBs with their balance sheets. There's a huge opportunity, I think, for us to rethink that. I would say on the, the private investor side, I think there is also a lot more that could be done there as well. So John rightly highlights the fact that we, we still lack a lot of the information, particularly for uh, companies in middle and low income countries. At the same time, I think we need to see large investors also step up and play their role. You know, we as an NGO fund an awful lot of technical work, data work, disclosure. We support governments, we support companies. You know, we've got huge asset managers that are, have got massive resources and, and we really need them to pitch in and start working much more closely with these, these companies across emerging markets as well to help them with that transition. I mean, you, you, sorry, yeah, come on in. Uh, just just to yeah. add a, an observation I had today. I mean, I completely agree we, we have to crack how we get capital flowing into developing nations. But, but actually, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned. Yeah, we haven't cracked it here in the UK. So, so my business, Phoenix, we're the UK's largest long-term savings and retirement business. Most of our customers are, you know, are UK-based, our 13 million customers. You know, we haven't cracked how to get 24 million homes in the UK to, to you know, uh, use green energy. We haven't cracked how to get the network uh, uh, aligned to uh, have green transport and electric cars throughout the UK. And if we can't do it in our own backyard, yeah. how are we going to do it in other countries? Yeah. So, so while we need to address that, that question in the developing nations, no question, but, but we, we, we've got to crack it really quickly it, it, you know, here, here in the UK, first and foremost, I would say. And, and then we, we learn a lot from that that we can take into, yeah. into other areas. Yeah. John, uh, John, yeah, come in. The, the one difference I would say is that you know, a lot of emerging market emissions are driven by electricity systems. Most emerging markets actually have fantastic renewable resources. So you can make a huge stride in very, yeah. in, in very short order if you, f if you put in place the systems, the funding and the policy processes to support that. And, and I think that's a really advanced first step that, that, that needs to happen here. Go on, Mike. Well, I, I'd agree with John. I think there's a lot more that can be done. And I think philanthropy, investors partnering to un, un remove those blockages in emerging economies. I would say the difference is that here in the UK, we just don't have an excuse anymore. And the reality is that the people outside on the street right now are saying, look, enough voluntary, enough 2050, it's got to be mandatory, it's got to be short term. We have the technology, we have the policy frameworks. We need people to start saying what they're going to do this year, next year. We can fund it. We need that clarity. And I think that is a big difference between you know, um, emerging and advanced economies is that here it's just a lot about delay mm -hmm. because we're not making mm -hmm. things mandatory, we're not making them short term. And I, I think that's a, a big thing that investors need to deal with both of those in their yeah, global and, and that's Yeah, and we, we've talked about this, uh, Ria Marie, because that, that's the point, because we, we, here we can actually act, but we're, delay we're delaying, right? And I think we've heard that a lot all day about the enabling levers to crack this. It's about policy and regulatory backdrop. It's around financial mechanisms. It's around radical collaboration, all parts of the financial system mm. coming together. I mean, we've got representatives from across, you know, uh, asset management and insurance and philanthropy. And we, you know, we need the banks involved, venture capitalists, private equity, as well as government capital. We need to be working out the, the solutions in the UK, the solutions uh, in emerging markets, it's going to be about collaboration. It's going to be a f about sharing risk with the right parties. Mm. Um, Someone's going to move first, though, doesn't someone they? Someone does need to right. move first. And I, I, I wouldn't want to be as arrogant as to think that, you know, we that our lessons in the UK can only be exported. We can learn from other countries as well. But we do have a stable regulatory regime. We have the advantage that this is not a politically bipartisan issue. Mm. Um, and so we do have a number of the of the 
of the real building blocks. And also we, also we have the deepest pools of capital in the world sitting in the city of London. So we have so much going in our favour. You know, another thing, um, you know, we're talking of acting and talking of, you know, stopping doing things as well, like yes. uh, investing in fossil fuels was something that Larry Fink touched on today. And, and I, I know you, you want to talk about this and maybe others can as well. Larry said, look, I'm in favour of a bad bank model for the hydrocarbon industry. These companies are not the problem, they're part of the solution. We need to be thoughtful about how we work with, uh, how we work with not against our hydrocarbon uh, companies. Bad bank model for, for what, do you, what do you make of that? Uh, I, I, I you know, scribbled that down when he said it. Yeah. I thought that was a really interesting comment. We don't actually talk enough about the cost of decommissioning. Uh, the fact that investing in some of these legacy companies, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I share all of Larry's um, thinks um, enthusiasm and optimism that some of these organizations are going to be able to pivot. Are we investing in a blockbuster when really we should be investing in Netflix? That's, mm -hmm. that's the issue. Um, but we do need a more sophisticated and nuanced conversation about what transition yeah. does look like. And, and the other thing I was quite... <sighs> Whether well, surprise is the right word, the extent to which he counts on innovation as a, as, as a solution here rather than, say, a carbon price. Um, but, you know, putting, he, he wasn't putting all his eggs in one basket by any means, but, but give me a sense, you three, what, what you, what, where you are on innovation as the solution. I, I just think, I don't think you can look at it in this way and say it's one or the other. Right. I mean, the reality is that you need that carbon price to level the playing field. You're going to need to drive a lot of deployment. I mean, people also talk about innovation, but it's about deployment. And that's an interesting challenge. It's particularly true for a lot of emerging economies. You need the price, too. You need the carbon price to, to get that change. And, and th those things all have to come together. And it's why we just need more regulatory. And, and it's why particularly countries like the UK need to stop thinking that voluntary uh, arrangements, long-term voluntary arrangements, if it's for investors, if it's for companies, they're not going to work until we get that regulatory pressure and it has to happen now. We have to lead now. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, I, you know, I, I really like uh, Larry's characterization of the journey. You know, it's from dark brown to light brown yeah. to light yeah. green. And, and, you know, that in fact many of the, the large hydrocarbon organizations have the capacity, have the human resource, have the cash flow, have the execution capability to do what's necessary here, and they are being motivated to do it. And, and, and I think that, that therefore putting all of those businesses into one bucket and treating them the same, again, is, 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 is not right. Mm -hmm. And that's where portfolio level measurement, where portfolio level lenses create such distortions. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a problem we have to solve. Yep. Yeah, so, so, I, so I agree with both those points. I think the, the, um, you know, the carbon price is, is part of the solution, but not the whole solution. You've got to have the, the innovation and the right regulatory environment and focus on creating the, the future as well. I also completely agree. We shouldn't just disinvest from brown companies. We, we need to engage with them and work with them to try, and, to try and bring about the change because they will have a lot of the resources and capabilities needed. There'll come a point where it's appropriate to disinvest, but that, that's not where you start. As, a, as an asset owner, uh, we, we start by engaging and, and looking really to drive the change through, through the, the companies we invest in. Yeah. I, I, could I just say though, just on the issue of hydrocarbons, it's fine, but the reality today is that, you know, if you look at a, a basket of, of uh, IOCs, it's seven to eight percent of their capex is currently going on low carbon. It needs to be eighty yeah. percent mm -hmm. for Paris. People have the opportunity already. Shareholders have known this for years. We have the IEA now making it very clear. And yet this year, ninety percent of shareholders vote in favour of a plan from Shell that is evidently not aligned with Paris. So it's great, but people actually have to start doing stuff now seriously, and people have the power to do that. So. Again, we need to get serious about this. You know, it's it's too late now to, to talk about it. As we, you know, I, you know, it's amazing how quickly fifteen minutes goes. Um, as as we held our breath before of this COP, uh, before this COP meeting, and in, in anticipation of what was to come, what do we feel about after after today? Do we feel look? There's a bit of momentum here. What do you think? 100%. Uh, very optimistic going into Finance Day tomorrow. There are a couple of points I, I think I'd really like to raise that we heard from various speakers today. One of them was from Emma Howard Boyd, Global Commissioner for Adaptation, as well as the Chair of the Environment Agency, really reminding us that it can't just be about net zero. We always need to remember about resilience and adaptation. Yeah. Otherwise, some of these assets <clears throat> will get washed away in the flood. Um, and Kelly Clark made some really interesting points from the Loudest Foundation as well about 
our intergenerational promises and making sure that you know this this cannot be the COP where commitments are made, mm. but we don't have the short-term targets and the milestones to actually turn it into action. And let's not forget that as we go into tomorrow's discussions. Yeah. Very quickly from each of you, good day today, Andy? Yeah, yeah, yes, good, optimistic, but we do need to, to, to move from talking to action. Yeah, mm. sure. I think, yes, practical. I think the, the common but differentiated principle is beginning to play out a little bit in reality, which is really good to see. And now that has to translate into action, so. Yeah, yeah. and Mike. Yeah, yesterday the Secretary General, in his speech, he called for a high level panel of experts to start assessing independently these net zero claims. And I think that's what we're going to need. And it's going to have to be regulatory and, and a lot faster than people realize, I think. OK, very good. Look, I want to thank uh, all of you uh, for your thoughts. We're going to do this uh, show, this wrap up show, by the way, at the close of every day uh, this week. Um, just to uh, remind you, it is Finance Day tomorrow. The big picture on the morning show here, we're going to be talking, of course, about that. We're also going to be talking about the emerging markets, really get into the developing countries and how to get that uh, money over there. So Howard Davies, chair at NatWest, uh, Baroness Shriti Vadera, chair at Prudential, and Gonzalo Munoz, uh, high-level champion of COP and the uh, entrepreneur from Chile, will be among a number of guests here in the studio. Do join us then.